Welcome to the Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives 50th Anniversary Speaker Series. I am Stacey Krim, and today archivist Patrick Dollar is joining us. Patrick Dollar received his MLIS from UNC Chapel Hill in 2015 with a concentration in archives and records management. He earned a BA in English and Journalism from UNC Chapel Hill in 2010 and an MA in English from UNC Greensboro in 2012. Since 2017, Patrick was working as an archivist in UNC Greensboro's Martha Blakeney Hodges Special Collections and University Archives. Previously, Patrick worked in UNCG's Special Collections and University Archives on a two-year processing project and as a student worker and as a volunteer. Today, Patrick is discussing political collections housed in our Special Collections and University Archives. Thank you for speaking with us today, Patrick. Thanks, Stacey. Um, I appreciate the introduction. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Patrick Dollar, um, as Stacey mentioned, and I am one of the archivists here in Special Collections. Um, we are going to be talking about political collections here today. Um, my tagline was read my lips, um, because that is one of my uh, favorite phrases from political culture, I guess. Um, that was a phrase that um, George Bush uttered, George H.W. Bush uttered during the 1988 Republican National Convention. He said, read my lips, no new taxes, um, although I believe he then raised taxes um, once he was elected president. So that became sort of a, a funny phrase that's always stuck in my brain. So um, we're going to talk about a lot of different things today. So let's get started. <clears throat> so what kind of materials does UNCG um, have related to politics? So we have um, posters, we have congressional papers, which I think surprises a lot of people. We have political ephemera, which we're gonna talk more about what that actually means. Um, we have local po politics, um, civic organizations that often overlap with the political area. And we have, of course, uh, our campus perspectives on politics. <clears throat> so why do we have political stuff? Um, I think that question comes up a lot as well. Um, most of the materials, at least in the manuscript collections, which is what I work with most frequently, um, so that's what I'm probably going to talk the most about, um, most of those materials were donated. So um, someone was interested in um, their papers or their collection being housed here at UNCG. Um, a lot of times that is because they um, taught here at UNCG or went to UNCG or have some connection to Greensboro and the university. Um, also, the materials do fit pretty snugly into our collection development policy because um, most of our political collections document local triad or North Carolina history and politics. Um, we're not getting political materials from Washington, D.C. or um, California. Um, no, it's all North Carolina related uh, materials. Um, the materials also support our instructional efforts and the political science department. Um, we haven't been able to get them to come in as much as I would hope, but we have lots of great things um, to support them. And it also reflects the faculty research. So one of the donors who we're going to talk about today, whose collection uh, we have, um, he was a faculty member um, here in the political science department. And so he his research is reflected in the papers that we have of his. A lot of our political collections also overlap with other collection areas that we're interested in, specifically women's history and LGBTQ history. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that, although those are more of the purview of Stacy and Kathleen, two of my colleagues, so I won't be delving into those in great depth. Um, if anybody is on the um, presentation that knows me, you, you knew that this was coming. Um, we're going to be talking about Congressman Howard Coble's papers first. Um, Stacy mentioned that I worked on a two-year project here at UNCG, and that was processing the Howard Coble papers, um, doing item level processing, um, so getting really deep in, into the nitty-gritty of the collection. Um, but Howard Coble was, uh, for those unfamiliar, was a longtime congressman and serving in the U.S. House of Representatives. He served from 1985 to 2015. He was the representative for North Carolina's sixth district which is uh, where Greensboro is located. And um, so his first election was in 1984. He started serving in 1985 and he retired in 2015 and he passed away shortly after retiring. I, I feel like he really put 
so much of himself and his life and his work that when he retired, he was he was done. Um, so Coble was a Greensboro native. Um, he attended Guilford College after serving with the U.S. Coast Guard, um, and he later studied law at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. So in his early career, um, Coble was a practicing attorney, and he also served um, as a North Carolina House representative before he was elected to the United States Congress. So uh, I thought called him Dr. Coble. So Howard Coble um, promised his materials to UNCG in 2016, and we received um, actually four shipments. It was originally three, but there was a surprise extra shipment that the National Archives found. Um, they had some of his materials over the course of seven years. So it was a, a massive collection. It was originally over 380 record center boxes, which are just your, your normal standard um, bankers banker style box. So a pretty big box um, filled to the brim with papers. Um, and that organization and description of the collection, which again, I mentioned it was item level processing, that's unique for our materials, meaning that we go through and take out every individual paper clip, um, staple, and um, really go uh, to a much greater detail than we normally would with the collection. All of that took four years. So I was on board for two years of that, but previous um, to me, uh, Andrea Cole also worked on the Howard Coble papers. I think she was pretty much working exclusively in the constituent correspondence, which is definitely the biggest um, chunk of the collection. But in addition to the constituent correspondence, there were press releases, campaign materials, um, schedules. So his schedule for the day um, was pretty common to see. A lot of photographs, a lot of them were photo ops um, of him with the constituents or um, future constituents, lots of like Boy Scout groups and, and other um, school groups that were visiting. And then his own personal papers. Uh, so personal correspondence, family photographs, his Coast Guard materials, things like that. Um, we did uh, weed out a lot of duplicates, so there were um, a lot of um, form letters that we weeded out. We just counted the, the number and like weeded those out. So eventually those 380 boxes got whittled down to over 200. I, I don't remember the exact number right now, um, maybe 203, 204, um, low 200s. Um, so still a really big collection. Um, it wouldn't be an archives presentation unless you had pictures of boxes on shelves. So here's my obligatory boxes on shelves um, shot. This is uh, Howard. Howard no longer lives on these shelves, but these are um, just an example of what type of boxes he's in. Um, these are our standard archival boxes, um, acid-free, acid-free folders inside those. Um, but the bulk of the materials uh, relate to uh, Howard's time as a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, and um, we already talked about the campaign materials, financial materials, um, legislative materials, but it also contains um, records, artifacts, photographs, and scrapbooks from his U.S. Uh, Coast Guard time, which are really fun. Like He went to Antarctica as part of the Coast Guard, so there's photos of him in a very, very furry um, coat, which is very cute. Um, as well as, you know, elementary school report cards, lots of personal things to, to really get a full picture of uh, Howard Coble's life. So what's actually in the collection? Let's dig, let's dig a little deeper. So the constituent correspondence um, is massive. That's the biggest um, chunk of the collection, as I mentioned. And it touches on, it's really fascinating because it touches on a lot of major political um, issues and touch points throughout the last, uh, well, then 30 years. So he served for 30 years. Um, so it, there are local North Carolina, local Greensboro reactions to things like Don't Ask, Don't Tell, the War on Terror, um, the September 11th attacks, uh, NAFTA legislation was a big one, um, net neutrality, tobacco legislation was a big one because of North Carolina's um, history as a tobacco producer. Um, lots of letters about defining marriage laws and defining marriage um, between a man and a woman or not between man and a woman, um, and as well as global warming and other um, environmental issues. That sounds very lofty, but um, a lot of the letters are much more um, personal and um, are just constituents reaching out. This one is actually from a future constituent. I just think it's cute. 
Um, this is from a student. I'm not sure what grade the student was in, but they write, uh, Dear Representative Coble, we have been talking about the earth in our class. There is too much air pollution floating around in the air, such as smog, smoke, and gas fumes. So could you stop the air pollution? Because the ozone is getting thinner and thinner each day. Your pal, Demetrius Davis. So there are actually a lot of these that students have written to Howard Coble, probably as an assignment to write to your congressman. You can see that this person is from High Point, North Carolina. Um, but a lot of the um, you know, actual constituent correspondence is uh, what, what they termed as case files. So it's people writing on with requests. This person who was writing in 1986 is writing about their um, VA check and it not being enough um, to cover their living expenses and asking if Howard Coble could help them do it. And you can see that they've highlighted, they've made notes. So they've highlighted things, um, not the writer, but Howard Coble's staff has highlighted uh, action items and what their request actually is. So is there anything you could do to help me? Um, their VA check is only 50% of their um, revenue or income. Sorry, I can't see that far away and small. Um, so they're hoping that it'll be upped. Um, I also, wanted to show you this because it shows that they have stamped it, uh, the Howard Coble staff has stamped it when they received it. They usually put in some kind of filing system number. Um, all of that we left alone because it's interesting and it shows how their process worked. What we didn't leave alone is personally identifying information. So you can see we've redacted the social security number, which it's weird. It feels weird to even draw your attention to that. But I like to, to mention it because it shows how in-depth and detailed the, um, the processing was for this collection and, and how much sensitive information people share with their congressmen. Um, people would send in resumes that had their, um, their weight and their social security number um, just looking for a job. Um, so it's, it's very interesting uh, what people would write to their congressperson. And this is in direct response to that constituent correspondence letter. Um, these, this is pretty typical for um, Howard Coble's staff to respond this way. It's, a, again, a form letter, um, which some people would then write back very angry that they got a form letter um, and didn't get a personal response from uh, Howard Coble. But um, the ones where people are actually asking for him to do something for him for them um, are usually a little more personal. If they're writing about an issue like uh, marriage equality or something like that, um, it would be a more standard uh, form response. Uh, and then there's personal correspondence. So this one is also a little funny to me. Um, this person, I, I don't remember who it is and I didn't include the second page, um, write, writes, Dear Howard, First of all, I would like to apologize for the stupid letter I sent you several months back. I don't know what happened to me. I guess I must have had one too many beers, although I was really wanting our troops to come home from Iraq and still do. Howard, I hated to see you move from your last location. It was real convenient and nice too. I'll surely miss you. Are you still in District 6? So the letter goes on. Um, they obviously had um, knew Howard more uh, as a friend and personally and uh, are writing to him still about the issues, which is funny, even uh, in the personal correspondence that that line sort of um, bleeds over between constituent correspondence and personal correspondence. Um, there are lots of photographs. Um, most of them are from his time as a congressman, but I really like his family photographs that are in his scrapbook that we have. It's been fully digitized. It's on Gateway um our digital collections platform if you want to check that out but um this is howard's uh the coble clan as he says his family um and there there they are howard is this gentleman right here that my pointer is pointing to there he is right there i think he always sort of looked the same um so there were a lot of processing challenges with the coble collection i've already sort of hinted on some of those um, and I think this would come up with any congressional collection that you would be working with. So privacy was a big one. There was so much personally identifying information and sometimes people would send like their whole medical record in as they requested help with their medical treatment or something like that. Um, so we had to make sure all of that was taken out or redacted. There was a, an impact on his constituency. So um, a lot of people felt very personally attached to Howard Coble. Um, 
and felt very invested in his materials. We've had people come in and who knew him or met him and wanted to, to dig in. So we had to make sure that it was accessible to him, to them, while also um, balancing the desires and wishes of his family and his uh, congressional staff. So they all had different ideas about sort of Howard Coppel's legacy, and we wanted to be respectful of that and um, make sure that we provided the best access to the collection while balancing out those other um, impacts. Uh, the size and complexity, it was a huge collection, as we have talked about, and um, it was pretty well organized, so that was good. Uh, it's not like some collections where everything is hodgepodge, but uh, it still required, you know, four years of time, uh, which is a huge amount of time for an archival collection to be processed in, but it was massive. Um, what I was struck with when doing the Howard Coble papers um, was just the idea that what's new is not really new. It's just the same, the same stuff, especially when it comes to politics. I mean, I kept seeing the same issues people were writing about in 1985 that we're still talking about in you know, 2022. So concern over government spending, um, a big, big focus on social issues, um, a lot of times hot button social issues like gun control or abortion rights. Um, armed conflicts are always a big deal, whether it's one that's happening at the time or past conflicts and sort of dealing with the, the fallout from that um, as evidence from that VA letter. Um, and looking to the government for aid. So again, going back to that constituent correspondence, people are usually writing to their congressmen to ask for something. Um, it's not always to just express an opinion on how they should vote. But most of all, I thought it was hopeful. I mean, a lot has, as much as everything was um, similar themed wise, um, there's still been some very um, forward progress on a lot of issues. And um, people were ultimately hopeful about uh, writing to their congressmen and the political process. Okay, political ephemera. I will get off my Howard Coble high horse. I know that y'all are excited for that. Um, the David Olson Political Ephemera Collection is another one of our really big collections um, that we use a lot in exhibits and um, outreach. Um, David Olson uh, was a professor emeritus in the Department of Political Science. Um, he obtained his bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees from the University of California at Berkeley. And um, he also authored several books on uh, the legislative progress and democracy, both in the United States on the and on a global scale. So he was really um, not just focused on the United States and politics, but all but international politics as well. So he amassed a large collection of political ephemera, uh, and ephemera could be things like posters, pamphlets, mailings, buttons, bumper stickers. Um, he amassed all of that ephemera and decided to donate that to special collections. And it's mostly materials from 1960 to the present, but it, we do have some materials that go back to the 19th century. And when I say the present, I really do mean the present. He, um, up until very recently, was um, still collecting election materials and sending them to us to add to his collection. So why ephemera? What is ephemera? I just wanted to give you a little bit of background on ephemera. Um, ephemera and really the modern style of campaigning were largely created in a temper tantrum style response to the 1824 presidential race. So Andrew Jackson had beaten three of his rivals, John Quincy Adams, William H. Crawford, and Henry Clay in both the popular and electoral votes of 1824. However, <laughs> Um, he was denied the presidency when um, Henry Clay lent his support to John Adams, Quincy Adams, and the House. So John Quincy Adams became the president. And for the next four years, um, Andrew Jackson, being the very cool and collected, not definitely not a hothead that he is, spent the next four years preparing for revenge. So he in 1828, it really resulted in really vitriolic political warfare that um, pretty much birthed modern campaigning. Um, this new campaigning method introduced the creation of mass-produced, as well as handmade, visual objects that were designed to capture the attention and the affections of voters. So the ephemera that we talked about. Um, during the 1828 and 1832 elections that were really marked by Jackson's desire for revenge, um, they created snuff and thread boxes, 
metal tokens and garment buttons, cloth ribbons and bandanas, glass flasks, cut plates, uh, and ceramic pictures and plates. And I think that it's really interesting because none of these materials were meant to, to last, which is where that ephemera word comes in. Um, so why would we want to collect something permanently and preserve it for you know, all of eternity? Um, why would we want to collect something that was ultimately not designed to last? And it's really um, interesting because that ephemera captures the material culture, both of what people are interested in at the time. So you're not going to get a snuff box in 2022 elections, but you did in 1828, um, as well as the material culture of an election. So what iconography are people using um, to run their campaigns? Um, it's also a great and pretty easy way to track political movements and figures. So you could compare um, someone's election campaign materials, their ephemera from their first campaign to their last campaign, which you could do with Howard Coble's papers, um, tracking, tracking his career. And it's a cool way to compare elections across states and countries. And sometimes the ephemera um, is, is targeted towards a state, but it but pulls in other states or na national um, events as well, which we're gonna see. So here are some uh, examples from presidential elections, some ephemera that we have. Um, I'm just gonna go through what each item is. Um, the for President John F. Kennedy, uh, button was from the 1960 presidential election. The Let's Back Ike and Dick was from the 1952 presidential election. The Pat for First Lady button was from the 1968 presidential election. In case you're not sure who um, that would be, that is um, President Nixon's wife. Uh, Women for Obama Biden, uh, it's it's labeled on there. It's from the 2008 election. Um, and then the two bumper stickers, I thought they were um, interesting compliments to one another because they are the same font, the same color scheme, but saying two different things um, and from two different uh, elections, actually. So reelect the president is from Nixon 1972. Um, that was his um, bumper sticker that was produced by his campaign. The impeach the president was made in 1974, uh, also about Nixon, but it definitely wasn't made by the Nixon camp. <clears throat> so we do have a lot of North Carolina specific election materials as well. Um, Luther Hodges uh, from 1978 ran for the U.S. Senate. Um, Robin Britt uh, ran for the in 1982 the U.S. House of Representatives, and he won that election, but then he lost um, two years later to Howard Coble, who then never uh, lost that seat until he retired. Uh, the I Don't Support Jesse Helms bumper sticker was from the, the 1990 elections. And the bottom uh, sort of North Carolina Needs bumper sticker is from uh, 1984. And it pulls together, you know, all of those races saying you need to, you need to vote a straight uh, Republican ticket. Um, just some other sort of random ephemera that I liked. Uh, the Johnson and Humphrey uh, button was from the 1964 election. And the um, Georgia Democrat bumper sticker, it's marked on there. It's from the November 1968 election. Um, the uh, sort of large-ish poster uh, is from uh, Minnesota. It's Republican candidates for a bunch of different offices. It's not just, they're all not just running for one office. These are um, all of the candidates for all the, the offices. And I mentioned that uh, Dave Olson was also interested in international politics. So we have a lot of really cool international materials that I, I um, would like to dig into a little bit more. Um, the solidarity poster down at the bottom left um, right here is um, from a Polish trade union that was called Solidarity. It was founded in 1980 and the poster is from 1989. The button at the, at the top is a uh, Social Democrats from Stockholm, Sweden. And this poster is from Nigeria for the United Party of Nigeria, hoping to elect this gentleman to the um, position of Remo, which I'm not sure quite what that is, like what level that is. So um, shifting to some other collections that we have, we do have a lot of local and national political collections that are um, housed within other 
sometimes not explicitly political collections. So one of the biggies is in our civic organizations. There's a lot of overlap between um, business uh, records and civic organizations and pol politics because they're all sort of interconnected. So political and business figures pop up all through the civic organization's records. Um, this item on the left, the Greensboro Community Chest, is the original name of the United uh, Way of Greater Greensboro. So we have their collection, we have the Rotary Club of Greensboro's papers, and we have the Greensboro Chamber of Commerce papers. And all of those are, are not directly related to politics, but they do have sort of political themes come up. I'm thinking of the Rotary Club um, and them talking about uh, World War II, like the genesis of World War II, as they're 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 having a speaker over and they're talking about um, things are getting a little scary in Germany, y'all. What about this this Hitler person? So um, you know, tracking political movements sort of in a ancillary way, in a parallel way through these uh, collections is pretty interesting. Um, other collections, I'm just very briefly going to touch on. Um, we have the Equal Rights Amendment uh, reflected in one of our collections. We have the Marty Thompson Papers, which focuses a lot on um, social justice issues and specifically LGBTQ um, equality uh, efforts. Um, we have a lot of suffrage related materials. Um, so we have the Anna Howard Shaw Papers, who was a big pioneer in the suffrage movement. Um, we have a lot of items in the women's collection related to suffrage. So that's where um, this book, A Story of a Pioneer uh, by Anna Howard Shaw came from. Um, we also have materials in the Home Economics Pamphlet Collection in our student scrapbooks. So they're also reflecting on politics in their, in their personal scrapbooks of their time at college at UNCG, um, as well as our historic photographs and then more. So just a couple of items that I uh, thought were amusing, that suffrage cookbook, um, on the left, I believe Carolyn Clark, correct me if I'm wrong, that's in the home economics pamphlet collection. Um, and the item on the right is actually from a scrapbook by Marjorie Craig. She was an alumna here. She was class of 1919 um, at UNCG. Uh, I can't remember which name we were at that time, sorry. Um, but this uh, little song, I think that she wrote it and it's about um, giving women the vote. So it's about suffrage. And I was just going to read the first two um, stanzas. So some men keep saying women of the South don't want to vote, or if they do, they'll surely cause the rocking of the boat. It takes about 10,000 years to make men understand that women whom they're living with are very much like man. And then the chorus, oh, give us the vote and we'll row the boat and sail the ship of state. For now we hoe and clerk and do the banking, but when we get the vote, you bet, for president, we want Jeanette, and will every one of us cast our vote for Rankin? So I, I didn't know who that, that was, who Jeanette or Rankin was, but I um, gave it a quick Google. Um, that refers to Congresswoman Jeanette Rankin, who was elected to Congress in 1916. And Rankin really pushed for a congressional committee on women's suffrage which um, that committee proposed a constitutional amendment granting women's suffrage in 1918. And Rankin is the one who opened the floor debate and voted yay in the House uh, when the House passed that measure, but the Senate overturned the bill. Um, these two books just always make me laugh. Um, these are books of rhymes for suffrage times. Um, Alice Dewar Miller uh, wrote Are Women People? And then the response, women are people. Um, campus perspectives. Um, politics have always been a really big part of campus history um, from you know, the, the, the students, as we've seen with Marjorie Craig, really advocating for the right to vote, um, to visiting political figures, to formal student groups, um, either for Democrats or Republicans most frequently. So we've had the young Democrats, we've had the college Republicans, we've had the young Republicans. Um, and just generally the students have shown an interest in politics throughout the years. And all of these materials that I'm gonna talk about are from uh, university archives. So again, not my bailiwick really, but uh, I found some, some cool things that I thought y'all might like to see. Um, mostly from the Carolinian, which is the student newspaper, uh, the Pine Needles, which is the yearbook, 
And I didn't put any links to the oral histories, but we also have oral histories that touch on political um, movements and social movements. So this is from the Carolinian, October 30th, 1956. And it's sort of a dueling narrative. Um, the person on the left, um, I'm sorry, Coney Crawford is writing why I am a Democrat. And Pat Hammond on the right is writing why I'm a Republican. And I just wanted to read a couple excerpts from that because it's really um, interesting. And I, I won't say more than that. I just want uh, y'all to, to hear it and to make your own opinions. So from the why I'm a Democrat, Therefore, after having reasoned this out, I realized that should I vote Democratic simply because my family has voted Democratic since time immemorial, I would be among the cheated, cheated by the lack of knowledge concerning the political game being played to the hilt before our very eyes. And then uh, they go on to point to the progress that Democrats have had in rescuing the country from the Depression. At the initiation of Social Security under a Democratic administration, Republicans cried socialistic yet they have neither formally denounced nor revoked this program. Why? Is this the answer? When Democrats enact welfare laws, they are socialist, but when the Republican leadership embraces Democratic enacted welfare laws, it is evidence of their tender concern for individual human dignity. So the person on the left is, is um, voting Democrat largely because of um, the Democrats' policies um, related to social welfare programs and um, the economy. And um, similarly, so is the Republican. So here's from the Republican side. That fair competition creates better service for the customers is true for government as for business. This fact is tragically evidenced by the corruption existing in Raleigh and most local governments where the Democratic Party by inheritance from the days of reconstruction holds a deathly grip on government to the exclusion of popular will. This stranglehold has resulted in and has been perpetuated by much by such political maneuvering as gerrymandering the congressional districts so that political majorities are swallowed up, abuse of the absentee ballot, legislative control over local spending, and a new system of counting ballots designed to defeat the Republican. So they um, say that they, I believe firmly in the sound policies and practices which constitute this administration's record. The attack that Republicans are for big business is true only in that the party wants prosperity for business in order for the whole nation to prosper through a stable economy. So again, they're pointing towards the economy and saying, that's why I'm going to vote Republican, is that this um, administration, which I am trying to look and see who they are referring to. Mm, I think Nixon, they're at Nixon time period um, during his first sort of campaign, um, his unsuccessful campaign, by the way. Um, the Carolinian uh, from November 5th, 1968, um, just the headline, freshman favor Nixon and Scott. Um, so again, the, the student newspaper, this is front page news, um, is going to consistently report on the political happenings and sort of where the students are feeling um, at a given time uh, during election time, usually November, obviously. So uh, it's a really great resource if you're looking for more information about how the students at UNCG were feeling about politics at the time. This is from Pine Needles, um, and this is just an example of one of the political figures that came to visit the campus. This is uh, Lieutenant Governor Robert Scott, and he was speaking to the students in McKeever uh, Lounge in Elliott Hall. And he's sort of campaigning at this point. He had announced his candidacy and is campaigning. The student groups are really fascinating. Um, I mentioned the Young Republicans but they're, and the Young Democrats, but there have also been the Political Awareness Club and the political um, clubs like the Young Republicans have sort of butted heads uh, against some of the other student groups that aren't inherently political per se, but like the LGBTQ group. Um, this is the Gay and Lesbian Bisexual Student association um, that was writing to um, the college Republicans in 1994, um, talking about the painting of the rock. So um, they have butted heads over time, but um, the, the college has always had um, very active students in all these clubs, which I think is really great, um, whichever side they're on. Um, 
think this is the 60s and then the 50s. And uh, I think that is it. So if y'all have any questions, I will do my best to answer them. So we did have one early question in chat. If you would tell us a bit about the pencil that was just on display. The pencil, yes. Um, the pencil is my favorite item in the Kobo collection. So it is an oversized pencil. It's about as tall as me. Um, it is uh, a campaign symbol of Howard Kobo was the pencil. He campaigned on the promise to take a sharp pencil to Washington, um, specifically a sharp pencil to the budget. So he really ran as a fiscal Republican and got elected as that and stayed true to that throughout his career. I think he even um, was involved with the Tea Party a bit because of their sort of fiscal uh, policies. <clears throat> but um, the, the, the pencil, I don't know in what context they made that pencil, if it was part of a campaign, if it was part of an event, or if somebody just made it for him as, as fun. But it, it definitely harkens back to his campaign um, promises and his campaign platform. And that really became a prominent symbol in a lot of his campaign materials. Like even years later, like in the 2000s, he had Christmas cards with little Howard Coble, animated Howard Coble holding up a little pencil uh, as he wears a Santa hat. So that pencil really became sort of his symbol throughout the years. That's a good question. All right, the next question. Have you ever found something in the collection relating to a politician that completely changed your mind about them? Hmm, <clears throat> I don't know. I don't think so, other than um, to reveal my own bias. Like, I, I was surprised by the, I don't know, Howard Coble, I guess, because he was a Republican and I uh, came of age at a time when um, George Bush was the president, um, George W. Bush, and there was a lot of anti-Republican sentiment, I think. So I was surprised, pleasantly surprised to see him be sort of a, conser uh, a conservative, but uh, a moderate conservative, sort of middle of the road and really worked, try, uh, I can't believe I'm going to say this, across the aisle. Um, he tried to, to to work with both parties, which was refreshing and nice, um, especially as the years have gone by and we've gotten more partisan. All right. And has anything uh, about or in one of the collections really surprised you? Hmm. Um, I think I just think the existence of the ephemera surprised me. Like I didn't think of that being collected before before I started working at UNCG. Um, I'd never, I mean, I've seen political ephemera, obviously on cars, I've seen bumper stickers, and that's really one of my favorite things is to see a bumper sticker, especially if the candidate lost. Like I always sort of have a bless your heart moment, like, oh, you tried, you supported them and they put up a good fight. But I didn't really consider that that would be studied and would be preserved. Um, by an academic institution. So that was really fascinating and um, surprising to see some of the things that got put on bumper stickers and buttons. I mean, it, it's not anything risque, but some things are a little funnier than you would think from like the 60s or the 70s, a little more tongue in cheek than I would have anticipated. All right. Um, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to put them in chat. Um, one thing that occurred to me, Patrick, can you talk a bit about how you dealt with the bumper stickers and things with adhesive? Because those obviously are preservation issues for us. So I didn't process the Olsen collection, but in looking at the Olsen collection, I think that they affixed the bumper stickers to acid-free paper um, so that the adhesive won't rub off um, onto anything else. Um, that's a good question. And I wish I knew more in depth about that decision-making process. But if we get new ones, I usually just interleave them with acid-free paper so that they're not touching anything else and put them in an acid-free folder. I have one more question and it's gonna be a little difficult because I just randomly thought of it off the top of my head. Um, 
How do you think like on uh, social media currently how memes relate to ephem political ephemera? Ooh, I think memes should definitely be collected as a political ephemera. I mean, they, be as we saw, they became such a powerful um, tool in the last presidential election and the election before that, um, driving in a lot of cases mis misinformation, but that's still really interesting to study. Um, and people sort of get a lot of their, weirdly enough as it is to say, their political news from memes. Like they, that's how they understand the world. So I think that memes are a really important piece of political ephemera that we need to, to capture. I'm not sure the best way to, to do that. Um, I guess you'd have to find what's trending out there on Twitter or whatever the new platform it will be once Twitter implodes. Um, but yeah, I think that's a really good question and a good consideration. And that's a whole, that's really like a homegrown, like that goes back to when I said they were making handmade items, like that's really homegrown ephemera that people are making at their computers or on their phones at home that doesn't, that's not generated by the campaign itself, but it's just as potent. So that's really interesting. Does anyone have any more questions or comments you'd like to make in chat? All right. Well, thank you, Patrick. This has really been interesting, especially, especially given the time of the season with elections. Um, and uh, thank you for, for presenting across the aisles today with our collections. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for coming. <laughs>